Hi, my name is Linda Burns and I'm the Creative Conference Director for Atlanta Film Festival. Back in 2020, when COVID shut down the world, we pivoted to an all virtual platform and for three years brought to you the most incredibly intimate discussions on the craft of filmmaking. We're moving all of these conversations to this YouTube channel and can't wait to share them with you all for free. Like and share your favorite videos and please subscribe to this channel. And if you want more information about ATLFF, Atlanta Film Festival, go to atlantafilmfestival.com. Thanks and enjoy. Uh, hi everyone, welcome to the Atlanta Film Festival Creative Conference. My name is Asif Faruqi and I have the pleasure of having writer, director, actor, the true triple threat, uh, Shireen Davis. And Shireen, before we get into um, you know, some of the things and, and you know, conversation here. I do want to mention uh, the myriad accomplishments here. Uh, Shireen's written for such shows as The L Word, Quantico, and Empire, and has directed episodes for Ozark, Rami, Only Murders in the Building, and various others. Uh, her feature film, Amrika, is a seminal film uh, about the Arab American and immigrant experience, uh, a comedy that I'd like to say well before its time and somewhat of a spark plug for other creatives from the Middle Eastern, South Asian, and Muslim communities who followed suit. Uh, so with that, I welcome Shireen. How's it going? Thank you so much. <laughs> it's, uh, it's going. It's going well. I'm, I'm happy to be here. Thank you so much for being here. I just wanted to start off kind of like I kind of tracked some of the things you've done and I, I know you've done it the hard way and your career kind of um, took off with a short film and uh, called Make a Wish. And you could quickly just kind of get into that before we get into some of the bigger stuff that you've been doing recently and what it was like to kind of break into the industry. Yeah, well, I was, you know, I, I did my MFA at Columbia and uh, made a, a number of like sort of projects, shorts, you could call them, though I, I don't, I wouldn't call them shorts, but a couple of things in the program, but Make-A-Wish was really my first short and the short that I, that I kind of took out and did launch my career. And um, I mean, it was, uh, it was a really amazing experience. You know, I went back to Palestine to shoot that film. Um, I wrote the screenplay while I was still at Columbia. So I wrote it in the program and then I graduated and, um, uh, raised money, you know, grants to make the short. And it was really amazing. I, I just, I wrote a story that was very simple and somewhat personal and went off to Palestine to shoot it and, um, and started submitting it to festivals, not really expecting that much, but, you know, ended up going to Dubai and winning Best Short Film Award. It went to Sundance, it went to Berlin, it went to clermont Ferrand and won two awards. Yeah. So it was really kind of an amazing experience. And it was really through that, that I was able to um, get my first feature financed, you know, sort of using yeah. that short as my calling card of, you know, here I've written this script, which, you know, the script from Rika had also written in the program at Columbia. And now I have this short film that I could say, and here is proof that I can direct this feature. So, yeah. you know, and, and that was really, I think, um, the package that I was able to kind of take out. But it was still challenging to find funding for the feature, right? It wasn't something that was immediate right after. No, yeah, it was definitely challenging. Um, I, you know, I, I had, I started shopping the script before I even had the short. Okay. Um, sure. So I, I wrote the script. I started writing it probably in 2002, I want to say. Okay. And I, you know, I graduated from Columbia in 2004. I started shopping that script around and I didn't really have any short film yet. You know, I had the script for my short film, but I didn't have funding yet. And at that time I was working on the L word because I'd taken out a huge loan to go to Columbia and I needed to support myself and start paying off the loan. So, um, so I was working, I was working and I was like really um, just hoping it, trying to get my stuff off the ground. And it was very challenging. I mean, I, you know, I had a lot of meetings in Hollywood, um, meetings that I either through Columbia, you know, certain programs or like um, film independent fast track, like different programs that are out there. And I'd get a lot of responses like, oh, this is too culturally specific. Or would you think about making the lead a man instead of a woman? Sure. Maybe Tony Shalhoub could play the, play that part. And I'm just like, I, I love Tony Shalhoub. He's great. Don't get me wrong, but he doesn't speak Arabic. And this is, you know, the, 
So it was definitely really challenging for a number of years. Um, and then, you know, throughout that challenge, I got the funding to make my short and I went off and made that and, and that helped a lot. Um, I think the other thing that helped a lot was that I was just someone who applied to everything. I mean, if I heard about it, I applied to it. If I didn't apply, it was only because I didn't know about it. And did you face um, a lot of rejections as well from the oh, things yeah. that you applied for? Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I, I mean, you know, this industry, especially when one is starting out, like, you know, it's all rejection all the time. And um, I was definitely sitting on a mountain of rejection. Uh, and I think at one point I just, you know, you kind of learned uh, after so many of them, after so many rejections, you kind of learned to just have a thick skin about it. And yeah. it almost became funny. Like, you know, how many more of these can I get? And I sort of developed this philosophy that like, well, it's totally fine because all it takes is one yes. Yes. Um, that was my silver lining was like, okay, great. All it takes is one. Yes. I'm going to get the yes one day. If I just keep going and keep going and you know, the so, other I have a quick learned. question though, before you continue really quick question. And sorry for interrupting you but That's okay. about those applications, for example, there are so many questions. It's like these essays that they want. Right. Right. And so if you got rejected one year and you're applying the next year with the same, same project, did you change those responses? Because the response for why you want to make a film doesn't change, right? So right, that's true. Yeah, you know, it's actually plays into what I was going to say, which is one of the things I learned is that no doesn't necessarily mean no; it just means not now. So for some of these programs, I totally applied multiple times, and I think that I did change at least some of my responses. Maybe not all of them. I mean, you know, why you want to make a movie, as you said, doesn't necessarily change. Although, you know, one year could equal a lot of personal growth for you. And therefore, your ability to articulate why you want to make something may change, you know. And so I think it was more like that, like me kind of refining things that I had previously written, diving deeper into the script and into my application answers and things like that. Got it. And then... Obviously, Enrico was a pretty big hit, um, and I, I believe it, it It actually made money, right? It actually uh, certainly uh, went way past its cost, from what I've read. Oh, then, well, yeah, let's just stick with that story. <laughs> no, okay, no, okay, no, I apologize. No, I thought it did. Um, uh, no, I, I like that story. Um, no, it... it um, I think that it was seen as commercially successful in yeah. part because it screened in so many theaters throughout the US. I mean, okay. it was a huge, it was a huge critical success, which was amazing. And it was a really big um, commercial success in that it actually at the time was the, um, I believe the most screened Arab directed film in American cinema history. Yeah. And I think it was at one point across 60 theaters or on 60 screens throughout, you know, cities in the U.S., which doesn't sound like a lot when you consider big Hollywood films being on thousands of screens. But when you consider that oftentimes these these types of movies really only screen on a handful of screens in cities like New York and L.A., it was it was a really big deal, you know, at the time. Um, it also, you know, our, our most successful territory was actually France. We were, I think there were a hundred prints of the film on screens all across France. And uh, the movie made, uh, you know, it made the most money in France, which was great. It's wonderful. And it, Interesting to know. But that said, yeah. the movie um, did not make its full money back. Got it. But that didn't prevent you from from get, finding financing for your second feature, right? It May didn't the summer. prevent it, but it definitely made it more challenging. It did, um, okay. Yeah, it, it made it challenging. You know, one would think, oh, you've made a first feature, you know, getting funding for the second one shouldn't be as hard, especially when you've had a success. Mm -hmm. But what's interesting is that America was shot in 2008. And yeah. literally when we wrapped, the entire world economy had collapsed. Yes, yeah. So we were selling the film in a recession in January of 2009 when it premiered at Sundance. And 
the entire filmmaking lands landscape just shifted in a massive way after that. I mean, movies that were being made for $2 million were suddenly being made for $200,000. You know, suddenly independent film took on a whole new meaning and people were really making micro budget films. Yeah. So for my second feature, it was actually, at first I thought it was going to be easier and people were very interested in funding my next movie, but interest and money in the bank are two very different things. So because of the recession, because of the change in the filmmaking landscape, um, it just, there was a huge gap in that, you know, interest versus, you know, money. And um, I ended up only getting half the budget for Emerica to make my second film. So you made it within that half, half the budget? I made it for, I made my second film for half the budget of my first. Wow. And yeah. you were acting in it, you starred yeah. in it. And right. was that, uh, number one, quickly, how, what, uh, how come you made that choice all of a sudden? And then was that a reason why you got half the budget as well? Because you wanted to be in it maybe. No, you know, funny enough, um, I was really, I, I was surprised how encouraged I was to be in the film. I really thought that there would be some kind of pushback and I was actually willing to step aside, except that I had been trying to cast the role for quite a while and just wasn't finding exactly what I was looking for. Yeah. Um, the decision to do it didn't really come out of, you know, out of nowhere or all of a sudden in that I, I am an actor and I've, you know, I've trained in, as an actor. And so it was something I'd always wanted to do, but I didn't necessarily intend to put myself in my own film. Sure. So I think that was where, you know, I didn't, it was something that I thought about, but I wasn't fully convinced that I wanted to take on the challenge. And interestingly enough, it was my financiers who yeah. were so on board that I was like, oh, I guess this is meant to be. I mean, they were just, the door was wide open for me to do it. And it, it, it made me actually go towards it more. Uh -huh. If anything, I was really fearful. Yeah. I was, and, yeah. and funny enough, it was the fear that made me go, okay, no, this fear is making me realize I need to go towards the fear, not away from the fear. So I need to, I probably need to do this. <laughs> so how did the directing part work? Uh, obviously, since you're, the lead and your, you know, it's kind of your point of view, how, how did you kind of direct the film? How had you watch exactly what you directed? And, and I'm sure that took more time, right? Because you weren't- Yeah, it did take a little bit more time. I mean, it was something that we planned for. Um, yeah. And I spent about a year and a half working with an acting coach and okay. kind of developing a process because everything is a process, right? I mean, you know, before I came, my process of becoming a filmmaker was a process of me learning my process, my process as a director, my process as a writer. And now I had to establish a process as a director actor. And so I spent a year and a half working with someone. Um, and what the process involved was working on scenes, not necessarily from the film, scenes from all kinds of different things but sometimes scenes that were, um, that had to do with my character that would allow me to explore the character. Um, and basically putting myself on tape and then directing myself and kind of getting used to this process of directing myself, whether I see the, the, um, the playback or not, you know? So I wasn't, I wasn't always allowed to, I didn't always allow myself to watch the playback in order to adjust my performance. Okay. Sometimes I'd watch a playback, sometimes I wouldn't because I didn't want to slow the production down so much by watching every take. I mean, it's impossible to do that, you know? And so ideally what you want to do is learn how to direct yourself until you feel like you've gotten it. And then you watch that one take and you either move on or you do one more with a specific note in mind. God. You know, you do have to really rely on your team. You know, you need a DP yeah. who can say to you, yes, I think you achieved what you're going for as far as like the blocking and the camera. And, you know, one of the things I learned that was really great is, you know, when you're in it, you can direct from within the scene. And so sometimes I could yeah. adjust the other actor's performance just being in the scene. I didn't even have to say anything to them as the director. I would just do something different as an actor and they would respond to me in a different way. So that actually was a very cool, you know, kind of insider's trick that I learned while I was, uh, while I was doing that. 
Nice. And what about the response for this particular film? And did that motivate you to go on and work on a third feature? And if that doesn't work, um, what, what did you feel about that in terms of how the audience responded to it? Because I know it, it premiered at Sundance, right? It did. It premiered. It actually opened Sundance. Okay. It opened, uh, yeah, it opened the dramatic competition section at Sundance, which was great. Yeah. Um, the reviews were mixed on that one. You know, it was it was tough because I felt like the film was kind of written off as like, oh, that's third world problems or sorry, that's first world problems. So in other words, reviewers are watching the movie going, yeah, but that's first world problems in the third world. And it was really um, dismissive of, sure. you know, of Middle Eastern films. It was, it was kind of saying to us that we couldn't make movies. We couldn't make romantic comedies. We can't make horror films. We can't make genre films. We have to stick to War. films about the political situation yeah, yeah, or yeah. films about poverty or films about things that matter, you know? And it was just like, well, but I was actually trying to do something very subversive and very different. And so, you know, some people really got it and some people didn't. And so it was, you know, it was more of a mixed response. Um, you know, I'm proud of the film. When I go back and I, and I look at it, I'm, I'm proud of a lot of things. I think that there were some things in the script I didn't quite get right. Uh -huh. I wish I could have gone a little bit deeper in certain aspects of the script. But I do think that it was a funny film. Um, and I, I think it was an unexpected film. And I think it was ahead of its time. Yeah. You know, a little bit like you said about Amrika. I don't know that the world was quite ready for, uh, you know, a romantic comedy out of Jordan. Um, and I don't, you know, calling it a romantic comedy, I don't, I'm not even sure that it's a romantic comedy. I think that people labeled it that. And I also heard like the term chick flick, a great chick flick from Jordan. And, you know, whatever, people can call it what they want to call it. I mean, my, my view of it is that it was a, you know, it's a, um, divorce film disguised as a subversive wedding film so Sub yeah. as a subversive wedding comedy that that was kind of the way that I the, the way that I thought about it but it, you know ultimately I think I wanted to take a little break from independent filmmaking after those two films you know I felt like I'd made two movies that were exceptionally difficult to get off the ground both yeah. being um not quite foreign enough and not quite American enough because of their mixed language, you know, in some cases like America, mixed countries, co-productions, you know, they're indie films, but they're also international co-productions, just really exceptionally di difficult. There's no name actors. We're talking female leads, women of color, exceptionally difficult to get off the ground. Um, so I-, I May in the summer at this point, I, I believe Alia was in that film. She was. She's a name at this point, maybe not at that point, not so much or? You know, sadly, you know, Alia is incredibly well regarded and probably more, she maybe would be considered more a name now, though I have no idea. Like, I don't really keep up with what, you know, the industry considers to be a name or not. I'm not sure if Alia could get a movie finance now. I certainly hope so. I think she's just a huge, huge talent and yeah. I love her. Um, but definitely at the time, it wasn't, you know, having Alia, having Hiam Abbas, yeah. um, having Bill Pullman, I did everything I could to try to put a package together to make a movie that would um, be attractive. And it was attractive to an extent, obviously, because I did get the financing to make it. Um, yeah. But it was still incredibly difficult. And, you know, the thing is, it's difficult. It's not only difficult to make a movie like that. It's then exceptionally difficult to get that movie out into the world and to get distributors to put enough money behind it so that people see it and know about it. Because so marketing is everything. The problem uh, when you, because you open Sunday, right? And that's a humongous market. And especially if you're opening it, you're a well-regarded filmmaker. And there's something that Sundance clearly sees in the film. So th did that help? catapult the distribution at all or it, it, it was did it, I mean it definitely did you know we got we got a U.S. distributor we got you know we we sold like you know a yeah. good really good number of territories yeah. so but you know the amount of money that those distributors put behind the film as far as marketing you know yeah. p and a, you know you don't get to really control that as a filmmaker and that's where it's just you know I made this movie that I really was hoping would kind of even have more of an ability to cross over than Amrika. 
sure. and it kind of got buried as like a little movie. Um, yeah. So, you know, it, it was it was a little bit heartbreaking at the time and I kind of needed to take a little bit of a break from indie filmmaking because I was so exhausted and I that was when I kind of got back into TV. But I am very much working on my next um, two features actually. I have two, two wow. of them that are currently um, in the financing stage. So it's been a while since I've made a film and I'm very eager and excited to get back. The landscape has changed a lot. Yeah. There's, you know, there's a lot more people out there making these kinds of movies now and that doesn't necessarily make it easier. Yeah. Um, though there are more avenues to pursue, but, you know, it's interesting. I was, um, recently putting together a lookbook for, one of the one of the features that I'm doing, which is Arab American, and I was just it, it was really sobering to see, um, you know, the the movie that I'm making is a, like a whistleblower genre film that stars an Arab Arab American Iraqi American pediatrician and immigrant, and wow. I was really just amazed that there are, you know, there's maybe one whistleblower movie about a person of color. Um, yeah. I was looking for movies with like, okay, let me look up detective movies with brown people. I couldn't find, I mean, I, I just was like, yeah, where are these films? Like, it's just really, um, they're not there. They're not out there. So it's tough to find the comps when you're presenting it. Cause that's what I'm mean, imagining. That's what investors want as comparable films to the film that you want to make. Yeah, no, exactly. I mean, I, I was looking, you know, I, I've been looking more for kind of visuals to draw from for uh, my lookbook, but all of the comps will be films, whistleblower films with white characters. Yeah, right? yeah. With, so yeah, there aren't really comps for exactly what I'm doing, which again, stars a, an Arab American woman. Yeah. Um, so it's, yeah, it's a challenging, it's definitely a challenging endeavor still Absolutely. all these years later <laughs> yeah well I I'll, I'm before we head into the tv directing part which is the bulk of what you're doing right now I, I did want to ask I, I believe you you're obviously represented you have an agent and a manager and for some of our viewers uh who are still getting you know their footing in place and they're in independent cinema or independent filmmakers What's the difference? Who kind of gets you the work if you have both? And why have both? You can just quickly kind of give an idea of that. Yeah, um, well, you know, the manager is in theory um, more involved in your day to day. You know, yeah. there's someone who can really have conversations with you about like where you see yourself going, what specifically you wanna be doing, you know, they're the person who's more often picking up the, the phone and making cold calls on your behalf, introducing you to people around town, like making sure that people know about you and your work. Yeah. So I would say that they're just a lot more hands on, you know, they're probably even reading your work and giving you feedback, like if they're super involved, then that's something they should and would be doing as well. Yeah. The agent is going to be lesser involved. You know, they, they do do some of that stuff and it really depends on who your agent is. So I've had, you know, I've, I've been lucky to have agents who are pretty hands-on as well and pretty willing to like roll their sleeves up and, um, and help me in whatever way that I need. Uh -huh. So, um, but the agent is going to be more the person who's going to be, uh, you know, getting the job offers, closing the deals, doing, you know, doing kind of more that side of the, of the work. So, you know, for example, you, uh, you directed Ozark, you directed Empire. It's usually the agent who kind of sets you up with those opportunities, not necessarily the manager. I mean, I, in all honesty, it, it's, it can be both, you know. Yeah. Um, they both get, they both will make submissions on your behalf. They both will make calls on your behalf. They both will field incoming job offers on your behalf. Yeah. Um, you know, when you're starting out, it it's, um, I feel like managers are most useful when you're starting out. You know, they're just the people who are gonna really kind of do more and be more involved in your day-to-day. -day. And so you ne don't necessarily need an agent at the beginning, but- um, I think having a manager at the beginning is probably gonna be more 
more beneficial. And then, you know, it's, I think it's best to get an agent when the agent's chasing you, when you've made a piece of work that's getting attention and agents are coming after you like that, that that's really the best time to get an agent. I think it's easier to get a manager when you're still up and coming and, you know, a manager can see your short work or maybe read a script and, and, and really believe in your, uh, your artistry, your vision, your voice. And then, you know, kind of take you on and therefore start to kind of invest in you as a creator, as a writer, as a director, or whatever it is that you're doing. Um, so yeah, that's, and, at the, and now where I'm at now, having an agent manager, they really both do very similar things. Um, my manager happens to be someone who's also producing one of my features. So okay. that person is, you know, just again, a lot more involved in, in you know, at least one of my projects. Got it. And your very first opportunity in television, which, uh, which television show was it? Which episode was it? And how hard was it to get that? Because you'd never directed television before. Yeah, it was, it was really challenging to get my first episode as a director. Um, I think it's a little bit easier now for women and uh, you know, people of color because there has sure. been such a big push, especially in recent years, to make sure that there is parity, like, you know, the, to, to kind of, you know, it, get closer to parity, let's say, in, um, in, uh, in various aspects of the industry. So um, I had to really work it. And one of my strategies for getting an episode to direct was to go back into television as a writer, because I had started my television career right out of film school as yeah. a writer on the L Word, on the, on the original L Word. And I, I wrote for three seasons. I got to be a writer on set, you know, for two seasons, uh, which was amazing. You know, I was prepping alongside the direct, the episodic directors. I learned so much being in the trenches of TV production before going off to make my two features. So after making those features, I thought, okay, I need a break from this indie film thing. Let me get back into TV. I ended up getting an opportunity as a writer in TV. Yeah. And I tried to get and the showrunner actually wanted to hire me as, 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 as a director in season one. He was a huge fan of May in the Summer, actually. Yeah. And, um, he really wanted to hire me and he wasn't allowed. The, the network wouldn't let him hire a first time TV director in season one. So he said to me, well, I'm gonna hire you in season two. And in the meantime, I was like, well, I don't really wanna wait that long to direct an episode. So I'm gonna keep trying. And so I reached out to my agent at the time who also repped Eileen Chaikin, who's the creator of The L Word. And okay. I had a really great relationship with Eileen um, when I worked on The L Word. And I hadn't been in touch with her for years. Um, she reached out to me when I made Enrica and we'd had lunch. She really loved the film. She's, she's someone that I kept in touch with, but not, not super regularly. Anyway, I ended up kind of suggesting to my agent that perhaps... Eileen would give me an episode to direct of Empire because at the time Eileen was show running Empire. Yeah. So she went from creating the L word to show running Empire. And um, Eileen was able to do it. Eileen got me my first episode. I directed um, one of the later episodes of season two on Empire. That was my first episode of television as a director. And then I got, and then Quantico brought me back in season two to direct because that was the, the show that I had written on in season one. And uh, the showrunner wanted me to direct in season one. And what was that experience like, directing Quantico? And well, you know, I I had a lot of affection for the people on that show because I had been a writer for a season. Sure. So it was really easy from the standpoint of like I knew everyone, and there was a lot of love for me there. So that was really nice. I mean, writing on the show was exceptionally challenging. Um, it was just, uh, you know, just for various reasons, um, there was so much going on on that show. And I quickly learned that writing for network was not for me. It just, it's not the way that I think, I think as a creator, as a director, my sensibility is much better suited for cable and streaming. You know, I just, the, the network formula, yeah. what's that? You can say so much more, right? In network television, there's. You just yeah. have to be very specific and you have to play within a bubble, whereas in streamers, obviously that bubble is bigger if it exists. Yeah, there. you definitely have a lot more room. You There's a lot more nuance. You know, network is just, there's a lot of cooks in the kitchen. It's exceptionally formulaic. 
and you're doing so many episodes a season that yeah. it's just, you, you honestly end up feeling like a bit of a machine, you know, yeah. like, um, it, it's so creatively unfulfilling. Yeah. Um, and my mind just doesn't think that way. Like I was the person in the writer's room who would pitch and people would be like, that's great if this was a cable show or if this was an indie film, but this is network. And I'd be like, well, I'm just not suited for, like, I don't know, you know, my mind does not think that way, the way, like the network way, you know, some people just are able to do that and I'm not. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And then obviously you directed Ozark. Mm -hmm. And that must have been a different experience because it's Netflix and, um, you know, it's one of the finer shows that they produced. Uh, what was that like? Yeah, I mean, Ozark was amazing. Like I, I basically, so I went from doing network to then um, my first foray into something that was still network, but felt a lot more cable and streaming was um, The Sinner. Uh, much slower pace, much like just more artistic. And, you know, I had a great experience on that. And then from there, I branched out into, you know, doing more streaming and, and Ozark um, was a really remarkable experience. I mean, that show is just so cinematic and um, so exceptionally well-written yep. and getting to work with the, the actors on the show was also just, um, yeah. yeah, just a really phenomenal experience. So it was a really, um, and I also was really excited about particularly one of the episodes that I got to do, um, which was episode, it was season three, episode four, where, um, where Marty ends up in prison in Mexico. Uh -huh. And um, it was really fun to do that one because the writer said to me, you know, treat this a little bit like a, a French new wave film. Like, you know, you can kind of deviate from the, from the look of the show a little bit in this episode. Um, and it's always so fun, you know, I, I've been lucky in my episodic directing career in that I've gotten to do those kinds of capsule episodes, you know, where I get to, um, yeah, just break a little bit from the visual style of the show and create something that's more uniquely mine. Yeah, because that's another thing, uh, and I'm glad you bring it up, is it, it seems that writers have a lot more say in television than the directors do, and the showrunner uh, watches every episode and they kind of have to approve, you know, the shots and things like that. Is that true? And, and how much leverage does a director usually have? Uh, yeah, showrunners don't approve the shots. So writers can't tell you what to shoot. The DGA protects you. Okay. Directors don't, are not told what to shoot. Okay. Um, no, that's good to know. <laughs> Yeah, no, no, no. That would be like a huge no, no. I mean, you could literally call the call the DGA on a showrunner doing that. Like, I'm not saying that it's not ever happened because some showrunners are exceptionally controlling. Yes. And and will try to tell you what to do, uh -huh. um, but they they're not supposed to. And you are protected as a director, and you can take it to the DGA if you want to, or you can take you can say to the showrunner like, look, hey, I'm I'm happy to to take your notes and you know, but they're not supposed to do that. Um, interestingly enough on Ozark, um, the writers on set don't have any say. Um, Jason Bateman has created an environment where the director has final say on, on the set, right? And then the producers who are also the writers get, you know, cause he, what he says is the writers got their turn with the script. Now let's give the directors their turn. And then the yeah. producers will have their turn in the editing room. Yeah. And I, it, is, it, it was a really refreshing way to see it, you know, to see that like, you know, Bateman was trying to create like a really uh, director friendly set. Um, so that was amazing, like to, to be able to have that type of, you know, creative freedom. And what that does is create like a real sense of ownership. Like you go in there and you're like, oh shit, like I got to do an amazing job because like I'm in charge. Like I'm you know, I get to, I get to really have a say in what I'm doing here more than, I mean, you kind of still do get that, you know, especially if you've worked for a while and people are hiring you and they really love what you do and respect what you do. Um, maybe when you're starting out, they're looking over your shoulder more, they're maybe interfering more. Um, 
but you know, again, I've been really lucky in that for the most part, I've gotten, I've, I've had a lot of creative freedom in the episodes of television that I've done, especially in the last few years. And what's it like to give a note to someone like Jason Bateman? You're directing him. I'm, I'm sure it's, it's something about like, you know, so long, he's so good at Laura Linney. I'm, I'm such a fan of the savages. Yeah. Oh, I love that movie, yeah. And, and she's so phenomenal. Yeah, I, I, I worship that script, how good it is. Um, and uh, what's it like working with the actors of that caliber and especially two that have made such a big name? And, and you know, I think Laura Linney is a multiple time Oscar nominee. Like when you call a cut <laughs> and, and you want something, what do you, how do you kind of do that? Yeah, I mean, you do that the way that you would with any other actor you know um it, it's it was really amazing in that um you know Laura and Jason are two very different actors from the point of yeah. view of like their process and their and and like the way at which they arrive at their like amazing performances um Laura is exceptionally prepared I mean you know she went to Juilliard she charts out the arcs of her characters she reads the script every day before coming to set to know exactly where she is. So she's a she's an actor who's thought of everything. Yeah. So often when I would approach her with my ideas, I mean, you know, one of the things that you want to do with actors of that caliber is it's it's more of a it's much very often it's less you directing them and you sharing ideas, making suggestions, saying, "Hey, I just thought of this. What do you think?" Um, you know, and, and engaging them in like, you know, their feedback, because also they've been on the show for a very long time and I'm coming in and I'm much newer to the show. They know their characters better than I do. But also if I had an idea, I didn't want to shy away from sharing it just because they have been around for longer. And, you know, I wanted to really think about the idea and make sure that I wanted to share it, make sure that it was an idea worth sharing. And when I decided that it was, I would share it and then we would have a conversation and they would either take it or not. I mean, um, Laura had often thought of literally every possible direction. So there were maybe only two times where I gave her a direction that she hadn't thought about before. Yeah. And she was like, oh, okay, yeah, I'll try that. And it was like so satisfying to have like that one or two times where I was like, oh my God, I actually thought of something more <laughs> I thought about, like that's huge. Sure. Um, but for the most part, I would approach her and she'd be like, yeah, you know, I thought about that, but I decided no, because here's why. And I'd be like, oh, okay, great. That makes total sense. So it was like, with her, it was like a, you know, very much a conversation, a collaboration um, with Laura being the keeper of her character and really being in charge of her own direction. Yeah. Um, and then Bateman was the exact opposite from the point of view of preparation. He's not someone who does at least any visible preparation. Um, he would, he, he's kind of amazing because he'd show up on set during the blocking and he'd have his sides. Laura never had sides. She never needed sides. She always knew the script. He'd yeah. have his sides and he'd read it and go, really? That's what's happening? That's what we're doing? Huh, okay. <laughs> And you literally, you go like, is he reading this for the first time? Like, and then, you know, we would do, we would stumble through the blocking, do the blocking and he'd go away, you know, hair and makeup, come back. Um, although I don't think he even goes through hair and makeup, but you know, the actors go away, they get dressed, they do their thing. We were lighting, getting everything ready. They come back and like for the first take, he wouldn't really know the lines for the second take be like okay he's almost there and by the third take it was brilliant and you're going like how did he do that like he just slipped into it yeah. he just like something fell into the into place and by like by the third take max because sometimes it was on the, it was on the second take he would be so good and you're just like holy shit um and he was amazingly open to feedback like he was so game and down to try whatever I brought up and so with him it felt more like me just throwing out a direction he'd be like okay yeah great and he'd try it okay so a lot more spontaneous yeah yeah, yeah it was really fun I mean it, you know every actor is so different and every actor has their own process so you know part of the fun of directing is just like getting to know them and 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 you know figuring out how best to uh collaborate and support uh, them, really. 
So my two favorite shows right now are Atlanta and obviously Rami. And I, I had never thought, I mean, growing up, uh, Muslim American, relatively conservative family here, uh, see a show like that because I'd never seen it. I, I never thought I'd actually see Muslim people performing prayer correctly. Um, <laughs> I just never see that, right? If, I mean, I've grown up on Indian movies right. and have a huge Muslim population. They still can't get it right. Uh, and, and to see that and to see like recitation of the Quran and things like that yeah. um, amidst all this comedy and, and, and dramedy that exists in the show. Um, what was, what was it like going on Rami's set? Cause that, that obviously is, I feel like you're like, okay, now I feel like I'm at home and it, it just seems so much, it's so unreal, right. To, to, to be able to see that. I mean, I don't know if you ever expected a show like that to be on on air, but I'd love to hear your experience on it. Yeah, I mean, you know, it's something that I, having been doing what I'm doing for such a long time, knew was just a matter of time before we yeah. finally were able to get our little space at the table. And like, you know, a, a, a little uh, a little bit of, um, yeah, airtime. And so, uh, you know, I mean, I was thrilled to meet Rami and just think he's so incredibly talented and the show is so good um, and so needed, so needed. And yeah, going, you know, working with him on that, on seasons one and two was amazing. I mean, it was um, definitely like going home. Yeah. Uh, season one was particularly exciting because it was just, everything was so new and we just didn't know yet what the show was going to be. And it was and because it was like, you know, first time doing it, um, it really felt like kind of going back to my roots. Like, you know, I got to work with Hiam again. I got to work with, you know, a number of actors in the New York, you know, Arab American, New York acting community who I'd known for years and years. And yeah. so it was like working with a lot of friends and, you know, just like really amazing, lovely people um, who were speaking my language and it was my culture. And so it was really, it was definitely like going home and like kind of getting back to my roots. And it felt a little bit like indie filmmaking, you know? Um, so the budget obviously for the show was not quite like the, some of the other shows that you did. And that yeah, no, I mean, it, it, it definitely not. Um, I, I don't know where it's at now, but it, it yeah. wasn't quite, you know, but I, when I say it felt like indie filmmaking, I mean that in the best way. I yeah. mean that in like the spirit of making something unique and and necessary and nuanced. And, um, you know, the show has so much heart and humor. And um, yeah, just so for me, I meant it like really in the best possible way. Like it was like me getting back to my indie filmmaking roots. Yeah. Um, and, you know, we got to shoot in, in Egypt. And so, you know, and that was really, I mean, talk about indie filmmaking, that was really getting back to my roots, like shooting in Palestine, you know? Um, so it was, it was really fun. It was really fun. Yeah, no, I, I thought the, the episodes, uh, which covered the mother character and the sister character, which I, I believe you directed. Yeah. Both were the most nuanced and and I'm glad that they actually got thank you an Arab woman to, to direct it because I feel like the nuances and the authenticity of that experience would be missing if it was just anyone else right um, right and did you ever uh want to be in the writer's room for Rami since you're such a great writer as well and you would know that world as a writer did you ever get that opportunity or it was just you preferred directing yeah, it never really came up. And I, you know, I think I've been in the last few years really focused on developing my own material and getting my next film and TV projects going. Yeah. So, um, yeah, no, it didn't really come up. And I, I, I was kind of content to just remain a director in TV for now as I kind of get my next projects off the ground. And, you know, in addition to my own projects, I'm, you know, looking to direct a pilot and sort of kind of looking to go to the next level in both uh, my TV directing um, career, but also my career as a creator in both film and TV. So uh, yeah, so I was, I, was, I was happy to be able to contribute creatively when I could, like when it was appropriate, like when Rami came to me or, ha or wanted that collaboration. And sure. I did feel like in season one, I got to do that a little bit, you know, yeah. um, a little bit less in season two, but it, you know, it, I, I just wanted to be there to support him and his vision. Um, 
because I, I think the show is so much his voice and his vision. So, uh, you know, I feel like there in some ways was kind of no place for me. Uh-huh. I definitely felt like I could contribute to, you know, episodes about the mom and the sister when needed, you know, but, but the show overall is just, it's so Rami, like it's so his voice and his vision, uh-huh. um, which is, which is great. I mean, that's, that's the reason for its huge yep. success. Absolutely. And, and then, you know, before we kind of wrap up, what was it like to, to direct um, Steve Martin? Uh, he's such oh a my God, and so then, much fun. And then also, so Gomez, he's just such a humongous star. And what was that experience like on Only Murders in the Building? I love them so much. They are, I mean, it, it was, it was so much fun to direct that show. Uh, I grew up watching Steve Martin. I could not yeah. be a bigger fan. I mean, to get to direct him was really dreamy yeah. and something that I just honestly never imagined. Like he's just such a huge comedy legend yeah. and Martin Short too. I mean, both of them, I just, I was like, I, I was kind of astounded. Like I'm not someone who really gets um, starstruck or like nervous. But I, I mean, I was like, I don't even know. I wanted to geek out so badly and be like, I love you so much. I don't know how to tell you, but I didn't want to, like, I just was like, I don't know what to say to you, but yeah. they're both amazing. Um, Steve is the kind of person who um, will come to set with like a million ideas. Sure. He'll show up and he'll be like, I could do it like this, or I could do it like that, or I could do it like this, or I could do it like that. And like literally like physical humor all over, like just all, and he'll give you five different ways that he could do a scene. So he's equally as charismatic in real life. Than oh my God, he totally is, he totally is. But the great thing is he'll come in with all of these ideas. And if you say to him, you know what, Steve, I was actually thinking about doing it like this. He'll go, oh yeah, okay, great. Like he's not married to his ideas. He's so open. He just wants to find like the best, funniest way of doing something. And um, it's really kind of a lesson. It was a lesson for me. You know what I mean? It was interesting because on every show, like I've carried a lesson with me, like the lesson from Ozark because of how generous and gracious Jason Bateman was. The lesson for me was don't take yourself too seriously because Bateman was always laughing at himself. And I just loved that about him. Like, I just was like, he doesn't take himself too seriously. If he, if he does a bad take, he'll just start laughing and making fun of himself. Um, and that was just so nice to see. And with Steve Martin, my lesson was just like, don't be precious. You know, he just had a million ideas. And if you, if you were like, you know what, I was thinking to do it like that. I'm like, okay, yeah, great. Let's do it like that. And, you know, he would tell a joke and if the crew didn't laugh, he'd be like, okay, let's not tell that joke. <laughs> like it, you know x that so he so he was just always trying things and always like looking to see what people's reactions and responses were and it was like just a great lesson in comedy yeah and then with selena selena's so lovely and and sweet and like so grounded and down to earth like it's unbelievable you know wherever we would go on location there would just be swarms of people yeah swarms of people and paparazzi. I don't know how that woman is so level-headed, cool, grounded, and amazing. Like, I'm just, I'm, I'm really blown away by her. Yeah. Yeah. No, I've heard, I've heard uh, great things just in, just how level-headed she is. And she's how just a phenomenal person. Like, she's just such a deeply good person. It's really, it's, it, it was just, it was great to work with her and to get to know her a little bit. Wonderful. Any other, you, I don't know if you're allowed to, if you're allowed to talk, allowed to talk about, to talk about any or, or a TV show that you might have directed and the episode still about, is about to come out or something like that that you can talk about or no? Well, the only <laughs> thing that I directed that are, um, the only thing that I, are, can you hear me? Cause I'm getting some feedback. Yeah. Okay. So I did do two episodes from season two of Only Murders in the Building. Yep. So that will be, I believe the show is going to drop in June this year, season two. Um, I'm not 100% sure yet. And then I'm up to direct a pilot, which is probably too early for me to talk about. So I, I won't mention that. But other than that, I'm really developing. I have a TV show. I have two TV shows that I'm developing. And I have um, two features that 
I'm developing as a writer that, like I mentioned, are in different stages of uh, finance. One is an Arab American, you know, whistleblower film, and another one is a Palestinian epic that I'm going to shoot entirely in Palestine. And then I'm also attached to direct a feature film. Um, and we just landed a huge piece of casting, which I'm very excited about. We now have an Oscar nominated actor who has signed on to be the lead in the film. I don't know if I can announce who she is yet, so I won't. I'll just leave it at that. But I, I am very excited. Well, you also had, um, and this is a while back, uh, but I saw a Deadline.com article. You were attached to direct something, and there was an actress from Black Panther who was in it. And I'm sorry, I'm forgetting the name. Yeah, Denai Guerrera. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, and that's still in development? That is shifting. Um, it was a film, and because mm -hmm. there is a, a, another competing film, um, we are now shifting towards unlimited series. So that is theoretically still in development. Got it. Perfect. Yeah. And lastly, just for, you know, all the audience members here and, you know, it's so much fun to talk to you. Uh, any advice on, you know, kind of breaking in and things like that? Because it's such a pain and it's so difficult because the industry, just getting your foot in the door uh, can take so many years. Any advice on that and, and how to keep your heads up? Yeah, I think, um, gosh, good question. <laughs> you know, I, I want to say, and I, I'm not sure why I want to say this, but I want to say, just do what you love. And don't worry about what people want and what the market wants and what you think you should be doing and what you think will be commercial and what you think will be marketable. Like, I, I, I want to say just find your voice yeah, and tell the story you're burning to tell and, and just keep knocking on doors until someone says yes. And you will find that one person, right? And you will find the one yes. It only <laughs> takes one yes. And no doesn't mean no. It just means not now. Maybe come back. <laughs> no advice. No is not no. It's not now. <laughs> yeah. Well, thank you so much, Shireen, uh, for joining us uh, and thank for, you for you having know, giving me. us and talking about your, you know, film and, and TV career that's still like you know looming so much, and it's, I hope it only gets bigger and bigger. And thank you. yeah, I mean, with that, I, I inshallah, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> and it's Ramadan, so um, yeah. Well, yeah. <laughs> Everyone, Happy thank Ramadan. you. So Ramadan Karim. Ramadan Karim, thank you so much. <laughs> Everyone, that's uh, all for today. Thank you so much for joining us. We hope you've enjoyed our conversation, and uh, please check out more films and creative conference events uh, throughout the run of the festival. Thank you so much. Thank Take you. Care, all right.